you got a Bible, you can turn to Luke 17. So it's fun seeing everybody. It's really a blast being back here. Yeah. And Linda only gets to come about every other time, so I hope you all get to say hi to Linda. She, you might remember she's a school teacher, third grade teacher, and she's taken off this year um, to be on the road with me. So taking a sabbatical from teaching to be on the road. So we're f- having a blast. Uh, we're still doing stuff overseas. I'll probably tell a little bit about that after in the church service. Um, one thing I'd like to start before I read this verse. I told you guys a story once about when Linda found my lost pickup. I had my pickup stolen. And I think I told you about it, but yeah. And I came home, I had called the cops and reported it. But then I came home and told Linda I lost my pickup. I was all depressed. So Linda just looked at me and said, well, I'll go get it. Okay. And she had that look in her eye that she sometimes gets. So I better watch out. So she got in her little Prius and drove around. We have about 70,000 in our town. And she just drove around, and sure enough, she calls me. I found him. I'm chasing him. I'm after him. She was running, chasing him, honking. Chased him all over. She called the cops while she's chasing him. I'm chasing the pickup that got stolen. Come get me. They told her, no, don't do that. I'm doing it. You get here, okay? So when she gets her mindset to do something, she's getting it done. So they lost her in an orchard way out in a dirt road, finally. And she came home. Not quitting, just taking a breath, okay? And then a little bit later, she says, well, I'm going to go find your pickup again. She says, I'm going to stop by the grocery store first, then I'm going to find it. So she stopped by the grocery store. She came out of the grocery store, and my pickup was in the parking lot of the grocery store. So she pulled out her keys and stole it and brought it home. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So when she gets her mind set to do something, I I watch out, okay? Um, Sometimes you have faith. And you just know, and you know, and you know, this is going to happen. <sighs> you know, when you got that faith, nothing's going to stop you. You can do it. Okay? Well, that's what I want to show here in Luke chapter 17, verse 5. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Okay? So anytime you want to say something this morning, please just yell it out. The apostles say, increase our faith. I want to do that, Lord. Is there a formula? Is there something I can do to increase my faith? Lord said... If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted by the sea and it would obey you. Okay, I think when most Christians read that, they think that's the answer right there. If you have a faith of a mustard seed, you'll be able to speak and things will happen. But that's not the answer yet. That's not how to increase your faith. It's the following three verses where he tells us how to increase our faith. All he has said right there is said, oh, if you get more faith, this is what's going to happen. You can say to a mountain, you can say to a tree, move and it'll move. And now he explains, this is how to get more faith. Verse 7 to 10. Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourselves, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave, because he did the things which are commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we're unworthy slaves, we've only done that which we ought to have done. Okay, somehow, in those verses, Jesus just explained, this is how you can increase your faith. And struggling through this on my own, trying to say, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? Say, okay, obviously, I'm the slave and you're the master. And it says the, ma- the slave has to work all day long. At the end of the day, he wants something. In this case, he wants faith. But he says, you don't get faith. You have to serve the master first. And you serve the master until he's satisfied. And once the master is satisfied, then you will get what you want. Then you'll get faith. After serving the master, you will get faith. And then after you get faith, say out your mouth, I've only done that which we ought to have done. So I'm trying to apply this to my life. And and this has been a major thing in my life for quite a few years, this passage right here. Because I try to do things that require great faith, that won't get done without supernatural faith. I don't want to live just like ordinary people. I want to have some supernatural oomph in my life. So I say, okay, God, I'm the slave. You're the master. What could I give you? Is there anything we can give God? So I search the scriptures, and I'm trying, I try to find out. And one thing I found out consistent is we can give him glory. And I try to understand, okay, glory, because there's a lot of the Psalms will talk about give God glory, give God glory. Some of the translations will word it, a credit to him what is due him. Ascribe to him the credit. So, give, Father, you have done this. You are great. You are mighty. Giving him credit 
for everything he's done. You've done everything good in my life. I thank him for you've given me a family. You've given me my wife. You have got us through the difficult times, accrediting him with everything that he has done. So I find out, okay, there's something I can give him. But I really wonder, is that what you're talking about here? And so I start looking for patterns in scripture like this. And I find some patterns. For example, in Genesis, uh, the flood happens in chapter 6. But then at the end of the flood, when Noah comes out of the ark, he comes out of the ark, he gives glory to God. He offers up his offering to God. And it says, and God received it as a soothing aroma. The next verse, and God promised, I will never destroy the land again. God spoke the next verse after he received the offering. When Abel offers his offering to God, he gives the first fruits. And the first of the meats, the first of the fruits, it's not that it was meat, but it's the fact that it is first. When you're giving first to God, your whole heart is in it. And God received it as a soothing aroma. God went, <sighs> And then Hebrews 11 explains that when God received his offering, he spoke a word and Abel heard, Abel, you're righteous. So the pattern that I want to suggest to you is that when you and I will feed the master, give to him glory, there is something about where he wants to respond. And he usually responds by speaking a word. And faith ultimately comes from hearing his word. A word drops in your heart, faith comes by hearing, and explodes within you say, yeah. Now, I was kind of trying to wrestle with this thing. Could this be how this thing works? And um, uh, I got that one book out there that's called Compassionate Capitalism. And there was a, there's a very wealthy um, gentleman who every Sunday morning, they have wealthy people all over North America get on the phone. And he leads a discussion for Christian uh, philanthropists, very financially blessed people. And they get on the phone every Sunday morning. And they went through my book for six weeks on the phone. And this gentleman leads the discussion. And all these wealthy people are communicating. Like, it's probably happening right about now. Um, and then they all go to their independent churches all over North America. And they ask me, well, um, since we've gone through your book, we'd like you to come on uh, one, one morning. And so I got on. And the first thing I got on, the moderator that day was a very, he was a Jewish man who'd become Christian. And he, he owns a block of one of the biggest cities in town. Okay. He got on and he says, well, before we introduce you, I need to correct you on something. Oh, good. Okay. And he said, you did one thing you left out that's most important to us. Us as a people who are prosperous, we know something you didn't put in your book. And he says, it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, but you must believe that he is and he's the rewarder of those who seek him. He said that second part, you forgot it. We all as prosperous people know God's a rewarder. And you will never really enter into God's prosperity until you understand God is a rewarder. Now, that was a new thought to me. I was trying to understand what are you saying and he says, well, it's in his nature to reward. Just like it's his nature to love, God can't help but love. It's in his nature to reward. And when you are seeking him, giving to him, there's something in God where he just wants to give back. He can't help himself. Oh, I want to bless you. And he says, we all understand that about God, that he's a rewarder. He's just the giver. He's the blesser. And it's like he can't help himself. And he says, well, we all cultivate that in our lives. As people, we have, through the course, it was about eight years they've been doing this. So they've been, we've been cultivating this attitude, and you forgot this key thing. So anyway, I have to re-edit my whole book because of him, okay? <laughs> well, and here's the scripture. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is the faith chapter. I'm trying to understand, okay, he's a rewarder. And I say he can't help himself. We don't want to say that in the sense that God's restricted. Of course, God could stop. But it's his nature. He wants to give back. And if you give to him, he just goes, oh, I want to bless you back. But most often, when he gives back, it's by speaking a word. A word drops into your heart, and faith explodes. Here's my Linda girl. Yes, who are? <laughs> she's the one that found my truck. So watch out. If she gets that look in her eye, she's going to go do it. Hey, Jacqueline. So I have faith. I say, God, 
I want to give you glory, give you glory, give you glory. And I, I start explaining the things to him that I'm thankful for because thanking him is also giving him glory. You're, in, you're saying, yes, thank you, you did this, giving him glory. And in my walk with God, I sense there's a certain dynamic goes on between me and God where I've given him glory. And sometimes I feel like God is doing that very thing of receiving it as a soothing sacrifice, going, oh, that's good. Now, usually in our worship, I don't feel we get there. Usually in a worship service, I think you get a little tingle up her spine. And I think God is starting to go, yeah, my kids are good. But to the idea that we can give to God and he can take pleasure in it was another thing that I had to change in my mind. Because I was taught to think, no, God has everything. There's nothing we can give him. That's just not true. Like in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, it says there were certain prophets and teachers in Antioch and they were ministering unto the Lord. They were giving something to him. And what happens the next verse? And the Spirit of God said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul. And I start seeing that pattern that when people are ministering, literally giving something to him, God's a rewarder. And in Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. And the very key verse, verse 6, he's saying, and without faith it's possible, please God. That's where he says, this is the key. You must believe he is, never had a problem with that, but that he's the rewarder. If you really want to be a person of faith, you must understand he's the rewarder. And Hebrews 11 explains what faith is. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But he gives examples of how God speaks. And when God speaks, it drops into your heart. And something then is created. And now you know you know you can do this. <sighs> faith. And something happens. When the word drops into the heart, though, in Hebrews 11, it also describes that faith has a power because the world was created by the word. When God spoke things into his, let there be light, let this happen. Well, now if God speaks a new word today and it drops into our heart, well, the world must conform to that word because the world came into existence by God's word. So if now he speaks a new word, that word has enough power to change the world. So I've tried to Understand this Luke chapter 17. Say, okay, Lord, I want to have great faith. And at various times of my life, I will think I, I want to do something for God, but I don't have enough faith to do it. And I, I know when we were in the faith movement, they, they told us never say something like that. But I'm a lot more realistic. There's times when I really don't have enough faith to do what I really think I'm supposed to do. And I think a lot of people pretend like they hype up their hope enough. Hope, 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 hope. Or, you know, you're laying your hands on somebody sick. <laughs> if I get it hyped up enough, then it's going to work. It, hope is not faith. Hope is when you're wanting still. It doesn't matter how hyped up it is. It doesn't do the job. But there's a change when hope goes into faith and you go, yeah, now. So I've had this pattern in my life where there's this cabin we use. I go up in the mountains, not ours, but... I can use it any time. And when I really need something, and I say, God, I go up there and first I say, God, I want to do this, but I don't have enough. And, for example, when we switched from working in Africa, 17 years back and forth in Africa, to go to the Middle East for Muslims, that was a major change in our life. We had worked Philippines, then Africa, then the Muslim world. So about five years ago, I'm feeling time to change. I hope, God, I want to go to the Muslims. I want to do something. And so I go up to the cab and I pray. And at first I'm thinking, God, I'm here for this. But in my normal prayer life, my mind's spinning and I got to quiet myself. And the best way to quiet myself is to start speaking out everything that's zipping through my head. And God, please take care of this. And God, take care of this. Please help my wife, help me, help my kids. You know, Father, we need this for, you know, keep on top. And so I pray those things until the peace of God. Pray until the peace comes. And it might take me 10 minutes, it might take me an hour. But finally, I get my mind to quiet. Sometimes I can't do it until after I take a nap. And then my mind is finally quiet enough. And I just, I have an easier time meeting God up in the mountains. That's where I was kind of raised to relax. Some people can hear God in the mall. I don't understand that, okay? I hear him up on the mountains. So I'm up there, and usually it'd be, you know, Three hours have been up there. Finally, I'm out of God walk. And I just go, God, it's so beautiful. You are great, God. I love you, God. Thank you, God. My personal walk is just, I, I just 
try to fall in love with him again and say, God, you're so big, you created the trees. And, and normally, this is kind of how it goes. Say, God, you made these trees, you made these mountains, you're mighty. After praising him for everything. And kind of when I, in my progression, it usually goes, God, you stars you made, you smoke it, I give you all credit, you do it. And it's like, I look down, there'll be a little flower. And God, you made this flower. You're so cool. Yeah. No human being ever saw this flower, but you made it. I don't, maybe you're not as crazy as me, but sometimes <laughs> you just get overwhelmed. God, everything you've done. That's the moment when I feel God goes, because my whole heart, I'm not thinking anything else. It's just you. And that's the moment in my walk with God I have felt. Then all of a sudden he'll, Drop something in my heart, a word. So I went up there when we were going to switch from Africa to the Middle East. And I all of a sudden, one word came, go. That's all it was. It got my word. But by that time, I'd forgotten why I had gone up there. Okay? So I had to remember, go. Go where? Okay? It wasn't audible, but it dropped in my book. That's right. I came up here. Go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I drive back down. I tell Linda. It was a Saturday night. And, you know, I think, okay, I got my word. Then I just that Saturday night, I remembered in my wallet, I had a business card that was given to me more than two years earlier by a lady in a church. I don't even remember where it was. She said, someday will you call this pastor? He's from Pakistan. I remembered it was in my wallet. I dug it out and I called that right then. I said, call on the phone. And I thought I was dialing Pakistan, the Pakistan number. And I said, Pastor, you sound so close. He said, yes, I am just getting off the airplane in Pasco, Washington, which is an hour and 15 minutes from my house. <laughs> I said, what are you doing in America? He said, I was on the internet talking with a lady who's very sick in this town. I have her lay her hands on the screen. I put my hands on the screen. God healed her. She sent me an airplane ticket. Here I am at the airport. He said, well, what are you doing? I don't know. I have a motel, but I am here. <laughs> Just so happened Sunday morning, I had a meeting less than three blocks from the motel he was staying at. So the next morning, I'm talking with the Pakistani pastor. You know, So it's the day after I pray. Because once you get a word... The world must conform. The world was created by the word of God. So if you get another word, the world has to align. So anytime that we've come to a place and say, God, I want to do something significant, not just ordinary by administration and effort. Father, I really want to accomplish something. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. I want to please daddy. Daddy. Pick me, pick me, please. Ooh, I want to do something on this earth. Ooh, and, I, and I don't want to waste my time either. I really want to accomplish things. So I, I do this, you know, about twice a year. I get away to pray and go up there. Well, we wanted to build a children's school in Pakistan. Um, and we've got two past train schools, and then we're doing these, you know, and I have a daily television program over there. But we wanted to build a children's school about two years ago this time. And I call, I emailed my pastors over there and I says, okay, how much is it going to cost to build the children's school? Because in Pakistan, Christians can't go to school. If they show up at a public school, they have to sit in the dirt, in the, in the back, and they can't have books. Okay, they're just treated as lesser human beings. So we want to build Christian school. So I go up to the cabin and it's just the same thing. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. And I forget why I'm up there and pretty soon it's the same thing. And then whatever happened, and all of a sudden, a word dropped into my heart. Here it is. Now, I'd gone up there needing 54000 because that's what they told me it was going to cost. But it dropped into my heart. Here it is. I drove back. Praise God. From there, the next meeting, I, I was to fly to Delaware that week. I flew to Delaware, and in a Sunday evening church, I just mentioned, you know, and as I was speaking, I'm hoping to build the children's school next in Pakistan. And that's all he said. And a businessman walked up to me at the end of the meeting, never met him before, and said, I'd like to give you $10,000 for that Christian school, but I want you to put it on your website so people match the money. So I'm giving you $10,000 to challenge people to give the other $10,000. So by the end of the week, we had $20,000. But then the following day, 
a church that we know called us up and say, whatever amount you need after that, we want to pay for the rest of that school. So within eight days, I got all 54,000 after being up there, and I got the word. So now we have a children's school in Pakistan. And it's a big facility run by Christians, but we have Muslims and Christians come together in this place. And all I had to do was, well, I'm going to go get what I need. And there's lots of times I don't have the money I need, and so I know where to go get it. I go get it because if I get the faith, something's going to change. So one more example. Um, I, I've had this heart. I want to win 20 million Muslims to Jesus. And I had that. A long time, I've just wanted to win Muslims to Jesus, wanted to win Muslim Jesus. So I went back up to cabin and prayed. And I'm doing the usual, Father, praise you, I love you. Then I try to calm myself because I got everything zipping through my mind, all the stuff I got to do. It takes me about two hours just to get quiet before God. And I take that from King David. King David, he would go inquire of the Lord in the Old Testament. Before he did something really significant, he'd go inquire of the Lord. And one of the Psalms describes it. It says, surely I've quieted my soul like a child rest against its mother to bring myself to the place of total oh god i am not so busy i can't hear god and then i just like to spend time with him father i miss you father i love you father it's been a while since i've really even turned my whole heart to you i'm sorry sometimes i, I don't even realize how my relationship with God has grown a little bit stale until I'm back there going, God, you're so wonderful. And come with glorious, thank you, God, for everything you've done. Praise you, praise you, giving him glory. And then I, I was up there again because I wanted the faith for 20 million. And sure enough, the word dropped, here's 20 million. And I remember, what, that's why I came up here. I drove back home, glory to God. Two days later, the, our, we have two leaders in Pakistan. One of them just arrived in Portland, Oregon, which is three and a half hours from our house. And he called me on the phone and said, Brother Harold, I am in Portland, Oregon. You must come down to see me. Okay. Now, you got to understand Anwar. He's a man of faith. Because the, like the first time he arrived in America, he was about 29 years old. So he's been here several times. And the first time he arrived, he came Landed in Portland, came to my friend's house, stepped across the threshold, and said, I'm here to see President Bush. Okay. Now, I'd never been to America. He didn't know anybody. Steps across the threshold, and everybody kind of smiles. Let's let that go. He sits at dinner and says, no, I'm here to see President Bush. This isn't the first thing on my schedule. <laughs> so at the end of the meeting, you know, at the end of this, this is two different instances. First time he came but I just want to finish the story saying but then later he called me okay these are two different the first time he came to America it was right when President Bush was going for his second election so sitting at the dinner table one of the uh, the wife of the one of the couples the wife and the couple she says well my father's head of Republican Party in Portland Oregon let me call see what's going on she calls up sure enough President Bush was flying the following Friday to president to Portland Oregon for a dinner you know, it's thousands of dollars for a dinner plate. And it was just before his second election. So on the phone, he says, well, we had somebody cancel. And it's too late to sell the plate. OK, we'll let him come. So 10 days after he landed, he's sitting in the room with President Bush in a private thing. As soon as President Bush gets done talking, he walks straight to his table, grabbed his hand, says, what are you doing here? He says, I'm here to see President Bush, you. And he says, you have Al-Qaeda working in U.S. Embassy, and I'm here to tell you you must fire all Muslims and hire Christians. President Bush did it that week. Hired all Christians in the embassy. Hooah! So when, when, when Anwar says something, I kind of want to listen. <laughs> okay? It's just, here's a person of faith. And there's certain individuals in other countries that I just say, I wish everybody could meet this individual. Hooah! So... When he called on the phone after I was up in the cabin Saturday praying, God, and I heard, you, here's your 20 million. I go, yes! I, two days later, he calls me, I'm in Portland, come see me. So I drive down there, meet him at a restaurant, and he's with a wealthy businessman. And I sit, and they say, 
we have started a television station in Pakistan, and it shoots up to satellite and goes all the way from Indonesia to Egypt. And we feel God wants you to have the two prime slots every day. God has told us. <laughs> let me pray about that. No, don't let me pray about that. <laughs> Hug you. <laughs> so, you know, there was open up, okay? Within a week of getting the word, the world must conform. <laughs> So five days a week, you know, we changed my, my daughter's bedroom into a television recording studio. And we have at least 10 million Muslims every day. Listen, at least 10 million. So, whoa, and you see, there's nothing in existence more powerful than God's word. There's no demons that stop it. There's no army that can stop it. It is unstoppable. Now, come back to Luke with me, would you? Look at Luke 17. He said, okay, you must feed the master till he's satisfied. I feel in my walk with God, I, sometimes I sense it. He's going, <sighs> that's when I hear a word, drops. Then he says, verse 10, so you too, when you've done all these things you're commanded, say, we are unworthy slaves, we've only done that which you ought to have done. Okay, so why is that part in there? Because once you get your word, you will see things starting to fall into place. But if you start taking credit for yourself, say, look what I'm doing, your faith will disappear. There is a direct relationship between you giving God credit and your faith staying up or you taking credit to yourself and your faith will disappear. Jesus says in the Gospel of John to the religious leaders, you cannot believe if you receive glory from men. If you start receiving glory, yeah, look what I'm doing, your faith will disappear. But if you will say out your mouth, all I'm doing is walking. You can't believe how easy this is. It's the word that's doing this thing. God's word dropped into the world. And as long as you say, all I do is walk. All I do is pick up the microphone and talk. And millions of Muslims are coming. So right now there's about 4,000 Muslims calling every day for prayer. But it's got to increase. There's nothing in the earth that can stop it from increasing. So then finally he gives an example. Luke 17, verse 11. While Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing by Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a village, 10 leprous men stood at a distance, met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, Jesus said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Okay, so all 10 of them walking to the Jerusalem, they're going to show themselves to the priest. All 10 are cleansed. Now, if you've ever seen leprosy, some of the countries you go to, it eats the digits away first, the nose, the toes, and there's just dead skin, white, leprous. Um, to be cleansed is to have the white, dead skin disappear. Now you have flesh, good flesh, okay? That's cleansed. So all 10 of them get cleansed while they're walking there. Verse 10. Now one of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, turned back glorifying God, okay? Glorifying God, there's the key, with a loud voice. So he turns around, glory to God, I'm cleansed, yeah! Glory to God. Running back to Jesus, giving thanks. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks. With giving thanks is also giving him credit. And he was a Samaritan, not even a Jew. Then 17, then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God? This is the only one? Except this foreigner? Then finally, verse 19, and Jesus said to him, stand up, go, your faith has made you well. Okay, what happened? The one that returned, giving glory to God, giving glory to you, praise you for healing me, falls on his face. Oh, praise you, thank you for healing me. Jesus says, are you the only one to return to give glory to God? Okay, when he's giving glory to God, he was made well. The word well there is complete. He got his fingers back. All 10 of them got cleansed, but only one of them got all of his digits back. And what was it? Jesus did not complete the healing. Jesus said, your faith finish the job. Jesus had all 10 cleansed, but the one that was praising God, something dropped into his heart. He believed. Yeah. And in his, ah, glory to you, God. Boom. His fingers came back. Cool. So when Jesus is teaching us how to increase our faith, he first says, this is how you do it. And then he gives the example. Watch. This guy was giving glory and watch. It completed. I think God often does that kind of thing. If, 
if you, even if you see God do something and you didn't get faith for it, but it just happened, if you start giving him glory, it seems like it completes the job. There's a lot of healings that don't get quite completed, I've seen. And I believe if that person will just give him glory, give God, you did this, you did this, no one else. Somehow God wants to urge us on. Come on, kids. This is what you do. Just give me glory and your faith will complete the job. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. It's possible to increase your faith. He is disclaimed, do this. And when I want to accomplish something significant, I just actively go up and say, God, I want to do this with you. I want to partner with you. I want to be like that centurion. Here's a man who has great faith, who can just hear the word, speak the word, and my son will be healed. My servant will be healed. Speak the word. Yeah, because if I hear that word, it'll explode in me. <sighs> now I can understand it. So, somebody got something to share, please. A foreigner, yes. Yes. To me, it, it does. Because the same thing like with the centurion, Matthew chapter 7, I mean, chapter 8, the centurion was the Roman soldier who said, speak but the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith with anyone in Israel. None of you Jews have shown me this kind of faith. But this centurion will sit at the table with people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. To me, it was like he's making a contrast. You don't get faith just because you're a Jew. Huh. It's latching a hold and saying, that's it. This is for anyone, anyone who believes and to walk with faith. You must believe that he is and he's the rewarder. So I, I just think he's trying to say, it's not just because you're a Jew. No. Look, even a Samaritan can do it. Even a centurion, Roman centurion can do it. So, is that how you see it? Yeah. It's good. Even a bald man can do it. You know, yeah. it just works. So he's saying, do this. Somebody else got something to share. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, the Pharisees, in contrast, you know, looked at those people. I think the Pharisees could not have faith because they were receiving glory from people. So I don't think it was because they were hated, but I think they're people who are humble. You know, it's not really the hate that, that caused them, but I think the humility is necessary for faith. And, and when we talk about receiving glory, I think you can receive glory to yourself like in other environments, like a movie star or a sports athlete. And I think if you allow people to adore you, it can corrupt your spirit and make you a weak person inside, even though you're mighty on the outside. I think it destroys faith to receive glory from people, the opposite. Like in, in Acts, when he, um, Herod, it says the people were worshiping him as divine. And what happens? All of a sudden an angel strikes him and his bowels gush out, full of worms. I think that's a picture of what happens in the spirit when we receive glory from people. I think our inner man withers away. So, when, so just to reword a little bit, I don't think it's the hate that makes them candidates. I think it's the humility that, that results from feeling I'm nothing before God. I'm only an unworthy slave. That would qualify them. Is that okay? Make sense to you or can you... You see something else. I, I do. Good. I do. I'd like to hear that. I, I see, and I see it this, this past week. Yep. And the fact that, because um, my wife and I, yep. we deal in the minister to the LGBT community. Cool. And they have great faith. I've seen this past week. Yep. As I've seen such hatred and vitriol coming out of the church. Yes. And when I stand up against it, the church comes back and they say, you are going to hell. These people are going to hell. Yeah. And what I see is Christ never once approached anybody that way. No, he didn't. Christ approached them and said, I love you, yep. I respect you, yes. I give you dignity and yep. love. Yeah. And he never once treated them the way uh, Pastor Graham, yeah. Pastor Warren, yeah. and all these people yeah. are approaching these people. And it, and it makes me so sad yeah. for those pastors because yes. I say, you are accepting glory from your people in your church. Yeah. And what you're seeking in the postings you're putting on there is you're seeking approval from your, from your flock, not from God. Because 
otherwise they would fall down and say, you know what, we have fallen. And that is why these people are lifted up. Because just as the scriptures say that if the church isn't saying anything, the rocks will cry out. Yeah. I have seen more LGBT people give glory to God yes. over the fact yeah. that God put these people in control yeah. to give them a standard civil right that every human being should have. Yeah. And they are giving glory to God, and the church is saying, you're going to help us. It's tragic what has been revealed in the hearts of the church through what's going on right now. Um, so I would back up a little bit, though, and say I'm not so sure that uh, I don't think we can really know why certain leaders do what they do. As an outsider, I think we can look and say, well, Rick Warren's doing it for the praise of his people. I don't think we can know his heart. Um, so I would just back a little away from that, saying, I think it's, it's wrong what they're doing. I think it's, I want to have a clean heart through this thing. Um, but I, I still don't want to accuse them of saying this is the reason um, that they're doing it. Um, I think a lot of people really do want to please God, but they're confused. Mm -hmm. they, they don't understand. Some of them it's because... Right, and it's wrong. That's definitely wrong, and um, but I, but I still uh, would just. I don't think we know the other person's heart. Why are they doing this? It's wrong, but I think some of them are just so situated in tradition and ways of thinking, they they can't make the change yet. I'm, but definitely, like Mark and I were talking, perhaps this whole. God allowing this thing to be passed is God wants to reveal the hearts of the church so the church stops being judgmental. I mean, perhaps God is doing a deep work to get us out of the very thing you realize and you're pointing out is bad. There's something in the church that's ugly. 100% yes, agree with you. Church has got to change. We've got to be like Jesus, loving and accepting of everyone, 100%. But I still can't take it the step you are saying this individual is doing it for this reason or that individual, I don't think we know their hearts. I would, I just want to back down a little bit. I, I agree with you a okay. little bit. Okay, okay. But at the same time, yeah. by looking at their words, yeah. their words reveal their hearts. My words reveal my heart and yeah. my heart's cry for those people. Yeah. Their words reveal their heart and their pride yeah. of what they're saying. Yeah. And you can tell what's in a person's heart because the scripture tells us out of a man's heart comes what? The words of their mouth. That is, that is exactly scriptural, and that's a scriptural debate. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, what is in their heart is coming out through the words of their mouth. So we do know some, what, they're, what is in their heart. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's exactly what the scripture tells us. Yeah. And that is how we are judged, the people within the church's work, by what they're saying. That is how we will know what their heart is. Yeah. So... Uh, we just consider just taking a little bit of a softer position toward them. That's all. Yeah, yeah but it, when Christ took a position, mm -hmm. yep. who did he take strong positions against? Oh, against the Pharisees. Against the Pharisaical members of the church. Yep. So who should we take a strong position against? Um, but but I, I know my own life. There were times when I've changed a lot through the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. My oldest boy um, is gay, and he's with a partner. Um, years ago, I had the traditional Christian stand that it's all evil. I just try to love. I'm only responsible to love, and I feel like God's done a deep work in me. But back when I only had the traditional Christian stand, I don't think I had it because, because I hated. I think I had it because I misunderstood, and I had not had time to work through what this means. So I would have said some of the same words. And, but I don't think my heart was evil. I think it, I don't, not the way, not hate. It wasn't full of hate. Fear. I was full of fear, some fear. I was full of confusion. I, I was actually wondering, God, what is the church supposed to stand, make a stand or not? I was confused. So I just, when I hear other people making the same words that I would have said 20 years ago, I just think I'm jumping to conclusions about their heart. I don't know where their heart's at. So I just want to be careful. 
pray for him because I was guilty. I've been in the same place. I don't think I am anymore. And maybe I still am. Maybe there's still more that got to be. I'm sure there's more still in me. But I want the church to change just like your heart. You want to see the church change. It's been wrong with her attitude. And, and I keep thinking of the adulterous woman brought by the Pharisees to Jesus. And Jesus says, I have no condemnation. If I was there 2,000 years ago, I don't know what side I would have been on. Would I have been standing with the Pharisees or with Jesus? I honestly, you know, I can see where in my past life I would have been on the wrong side. And a whole lot of people today are on the wrong side. But I still, I don't know if it's because there's hate in their heart, they're doing it for the, for the fans of their people, or if they're doing it because they're confused, or they're doing it because they haven't worked through the issues. I just have to... So. Yeah, but even like that, um, I, I wouldn't say the church. I would say about half the church went crazy over it. I have to soften your words. Your words. Oh, I'm not, that's what I'm saying. Half the church today is no, crazy over this. But see, your words are too harsh and too judgmental. You just said the church. People like me say, no, half the church at that time went crazy over it. There's some, to me, there's something in your heart that's overreacting. You're being too judgmental because you've been hurt by this thing. I yes. Too many people commit suicide because of it. I do too. I because they feel condemned. I've seen somebody self immolate. Yeah. I've seen it personally. Yeah. I've seen somebody self immolated yeah. because yeah. of things that were posted on their Facebook page yeah. by the church. No, by no, people, no. By people who said they were the church. Yes, okay, there. But you see, right there you had to qualify your words. Had I not caught you on it, you would have said by the church. There's something in your heart that's too judgmental, it's gone too far. No, there's lots of people who are trying to say the opposite. They're trying to be loving. The there church... Are some people are, yes, but they're, they're, if you look at those pages, yeah. people who have what I consider to be the right views, they're not being There are some people like that, but from my perspective, I think less than 5% of the church would be take joy over somebody killing themselves for that. Oh, I think I less than 5%. Joy in it, but I, I do say that okay, but see, your, your words are revealing your heart right now. You're over, you're angry at the church. And, and so I would ask you to check out your heart. I do. Because we're all trying to get this figured out. And I think the church is in a major transition right now. And God's forcing us to make a major transition. Um, and I, and it's a good thing that we're being forced through this transition. And some people are dragging and there's going to be a war for another 20 years. Um, but at the same time, I'm seeing some progress with the church. So I have hope for the church. Because um, I, I have hope for myself. Yeah, and I want to say to you, I understand. Yeah. I think you need to be heard my in your heart. My come back to the church because somebody from this church, after I brought her and her fiancé, posted something on her Facebook page. Oh, that's terrible. And that was one of the reasons that yeah. people come back to the church. Yeah. And she won't go to any church because this is what people think. Yep. Not a single person from the church here Yeah. See, that's not true. I greeted your your daughter that Her, day. But I'm thinking on Facebook. Okay, well, see, that's a different right. that's a different yeah. situation. So you tend to paint one picture right. as the whole picture. And I just want to tell you, I see where you're coming from, and we've chosen to see your heart and recognize that you have hurt there.
mean, you're, you're speaking from it right now, and I want to tell you, it's not wrong to be hurt, but it is wrong to respond to that hurt in a way that also inflicts pain to other people. And I think that's kind of where we're going here, that maybe we, we're only continuing a cycle that we probably ought to end. And so I really do appreciate, Manny. I think you know that I know your heart, and I know how you're feeling and what you're experiencing, your family's experiencing. And we're attempting in this atmosphere here to create an environment by which everyone can feel the love of a father toward them. We're not perfect yet, and we can't take responsibility for anyone that walks in our doors and says what they say and forgive. Please, on behalf of that person, I ask that you forgive us. I mean that. Because I don't think they represented the heart of this family when they did whatever they said. And I've tried to call out of that. Yeah. But it only takes one word from one person yeah. to cause somebody to I understand. Out. I really do understand that. Yeah. Father, we ask your forgiveness again in this process that we are condemning and we aren't reflecting your heart. Please forgive us again, oh God. Please, we ask your forgiveness. And we ask for help. We ask for help to be like your son, Jesus. To be like your son, Jesus. Help us, oh God. And help your church, please. Father, we want to be who you want us to be. That we sound of our heart will not be condemnation please lord and we thank you we thank you god In jesus name it's almost time to quit and close um please also remember you can increase your faith if you want we certainly acknowledge this discussion but please realize if you don't have faith to do something significant do it yes yes when God, when I'm up praising God and worshiping Him, He drops a word into my heart, He will always answer, but sometimes it's not the answer I want. Sometimes, instead of, here's your money, He might say, get a job. Okay? He always answers the answer, but it's not always the answer you want, and it's not always supernatural. You are the answer. Yes. Okay? So let's... Stand up and go greet and say hi to everybody. <laughs>